welcome everyone. Uh, sorry about the tiny technical trouble we had. Um, um, so uh, welcome uh, to today's TCS Plus um, given by Dora Minter. Uh, before I begin, let me uh, thank uh, the fellow uh, organizers. Uh, Gautam Kamat is here helping with the operation. Uh, Anindya De, Thomas uh, Vidik, Clement Cannon, Ilya Rasenstein. Uh, and also before we begin, I should mention that in two weeks, we'll have uh, Michael Kearns. Um, so, uh, maybe, and maybe quickly go around the table. It seems like everyone is here. So let's try to quickly go around the table. We have a full house today. So, uh, G. Great, I'll uh, yeah take us around the table. Um, first off, we have Amit who's uh, leading the group at BU this week. We have Andre, who's bringing us a contingent from MPI. We have Irfan, who's at Indiana University. We have uh, Fang Yi at Michigan. Govins, who's representing the gang at MIT. We have Huck, who's uh, with a group at Northwestern. Um, we have Jen Chung, I'm, I believe that, I'm not sure which affiliation, I'm sorry. Uh, we have Josh Grocho with a group at CU Boulder. We have uh, Samson at Purdue. We have uh, Sefer, um, again, I'm, not so, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which affiliation. Uh, we have Shravas uh, at NYU. We have uh, Thomas. Uh, we have Thomas Vidic, who's with a group at Caltech. We have uh, Vedat with a group at Waterloo. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't uh, read the name. Uh, and uh, that's all the groups. Uh, back to Oded. That group looks like CMU. Uh, so welcome everyone again. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, uh, Dor Mintze. Dor Mintze is a um, uh, graduate student uh, in uh, Tel Aviv University, is uh, supervised by Muli Safra. Um, Dor won several prizes, several uh, scholarships, the Wolf Foundation Scholarship and the Clore Scholarship. Um, Dor is interested in uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, early in his uh, studies he, uh, together with uh, Muli and Subash, they made a big breakthrough on open question on the monotonicity testing, but that wasn't enough for Dor. So uh, recently he started working on the unique games conjecture and that's what we're here today. Uh, another uh, very big breakthrough uh, on proving um, the uh, two to two conjecture. So uh, welcome Dor and please. Uh, thank you, Dad. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about two to two games and relation to expansion on the Glassman graph. Uh, this talk is based on several joint works with Iridinu, Subash Kot, Guy Kinder, and Muli uh, So before we get to talk about anything in the title, let us uh, begin with a motivating problem, and that of uh, the clip, the click problem. Uh, so uh, given a graph, a click uh, is a set of vertices such that any two of them are connected by an edge, okay? And the problem that we are interested in is the following promise problem. So we are given a graph and we are promised that there exists a clique containing 49% of the vertices. And we wish to find the largest cliques possible efficiently, okay? Uh, okay, so can we find a clique of size 25% of the vertices? Okay, maybe a little less, maybe one over 16. Maybe this we can do. Uh, still uh, too hard. Uh, what about anything non trivial, anything non negligible? Uh, yeah, so we don't know how to do that either. So here is uh, the click. And in fact, we suspect that this problem is in fact hard, but we don't know how to prove it under uh, uh, standard assumptions. 
So instead, what we do is we prove it under stronger assumption, namely the unique and conjecture, which we define next. Okay, uh, so what is a unique game? So here is the definition. A unique game consists of a set of variables x and a set of equations. And each equation is of the form xi minus xj equals b and uh, modulo uh, some uh, uh, prime number q, which is large. Okay. So one example of a unique game is uh, the max cut problem. Well, for each vertex, we have a variable, and the equations are simply xu minus xv equals one for any edge uv. And uh, what do we want to do? We want to find good assignments for unique games, meaning we want to find an assignment uh, 0, 1 to the q minus 1 to the variables so that we satisfy as many equations as possible. Okay, so this is the definition of unique games. Okay, so uh, what do we know about this problem? Uh, we don't know much, but we conjecture a lot about it. Uh, so this is what is known as the unique games conjecture uh, by Subash Kot. Uh, this conjecture states that for every epsilon greater than zero, if I give you a unique game instance and ask you to distinguish whether it has value at least one minus epsilon, meaning you can satisfy at least one minus epsilon of the equations, or it has value at most epsilon, then this task is empty hard. Okay, and uh, perhaps the, 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 the reason this uh, problem is so interesting is because it has a lot of implications, especially in the field of hardness of approximation. Uh, so for example, you can prove that the click, the click problem that we started with is NP-hard, assuming UGC. And in fact, you can get much more. So here's a, a quite partial list, but there are uh, much more results that you can prove using that. Okay, so we can prove a lot assuming it, but we don't have much evidence for it. We don't know much about how to prove it. Uh, so if you think that the conjecture is true, then you might uh, try to prove it. And uh, indeed, people tried, and there are some partial results in that uh, direction. And recently, there was also a candidate construction by Kotin Moscovich, uh, but this is still far from achieving the UDC because uh, this is only a candidate construction, so it's not proven. And even if, if it is proven, then it's only a first step towards it. And if you believe that the conjecture is false, then you might try to do the algorithms, and indeed people did. So there are a lot of STP-based algorithms, but perhaps the most well-known algorithm for this problem is the sub-exponential time algorithm of Farrow, Barak, and Stora. Uh, so, yeah, uh, once you see this algorithm, you start wondering, maybe UGC is false. Maybe it's just a matter of time before somebody finds a better algorithm or improves the analysis or something like that, uh, thereby refuting the Unigans conjecture. Uh, but this is not known, and uh, as I'll try to explain to you later, this is probably not the case. So, in reality, all this algorithm really says is that it gives a certain lower bound on the blow up size that the reaction needs to have from three sets. Okay, so uh, strictly speaking, this talk is not about unique games, but about something related, which is two to two games. Uh, so, what is a two to two game? So, a two to two game is very similar to unique games, but instead of having equations of the form xi minus xj equals b, we allow xi minus xj to take two values, b or b prime. Okay, so for this problem, again, we don't know much about, uh, so we conjecture things, and in the same paper introducing the unique games conjecture, Kot also conjectured that this problem is very hard. So we conjecture that for every epsilon greater than zero, if I give you an instance, you cannot tell if it is fully satisfiable or if it is at most 
epsilon satisfy that. Okay. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, just a small comment, it's obvious, but those B and B prime can be different from one equation to another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, one point about uh, two to two is that here we, in the in the completest case we have value equals one, not one minus epsilon. Like in the Unigame projection, this is because uh, for Unigames there is an obvious obstacle to that; it's simply false. But here you can hope to get that. But other than that, the Unigame projection is stronger. Okay. Uh, so if the, if this talk would have happened about uh, two months ago, then I would state that this is our main results, our main result, and I tell tell you that there is a certain combinatorial hypothesis such that if you assume that it is NPR to distinguish between value at least one minus epsilon and value at most epsilon. But uh, this talk is today, not two months ago, so I can say something stronger. So uh, this theorem already has some implications for the games, and we'll talk about it later. But uh, the, the theorem that I state today is the following. So I can take this hypothesis down, and I can just say that this is uh, true. For every epsilon greater than zero, uh, it is NPR to distribute between one minus epsilon, epsilon. But for that, you need uh, to work a little more. Okay. Uh, so I, I will not describe the reduction uh, uh, today. I, I hope to give some ideas of what goes into it. And uh, probably the main tool in this reduction is the following object called the Grassmann graph. Uh, so uh, given V linear subspace, su uh, linear space over F2, uh, let K be its dimension and let L be a much smaller integer. Then the Grassmann graph consists of, the vertices consist of all L-dimensional subspaces of V. And two subspaces are connected by an edge if their uh, intersection is of dimension L minus one. Meaning they are almost the same, but, uh, no, but, but they are not the same. Okay. Uh, so once you see this graph, you start asking yourself, uh, okay, uh, why should we care? Why, why should we study this graph? And in particular, why should we study about, why should we study expansion on it? So I hope to convince you that these two questions are interesting. Um, but before I do that, let me just give you a general recipe of PCP reductions. Okay, so, in a PCP reduction, uh, you have a starting point, which is a really quite a generic one. Uh, you have your basic PCP theorem, and usually the soundness is uh, too high, and you want to make it smaller, so you apply a parallel detection theorem. Uh, sometimes you even do it smoothly, uh, and then you need to do something called inner PCP. And this inner PCP, it really depends on what you're trying to prove hardness for, but usually it amounts to designing some, uh, to take the long code and design some test on it, uh, which is called a detached test. And this test should use what you're trying to prove hardness for. But uh, don't worry if you don't know uh, what, what it is. Uh, the reason that I'm telling you that is that we are using something slightly different. So instead of using the long code, we're using the other mount code. And the reason is that this graph, Grassmann graph, has linear structure. So we need some code that behaves nicely with linear uh, structure. And this code is uh, very nice. And the test is uh, something we call the Grassmann test, which, which, which we uh, next describe. And accordingly, because everything is linear here, we also need our starting point to be linear. Uh, so the starting point is uh, the max real link problem, uh, shown to be hard by Aster. Okay. Uh, so let me describe to you what the Grassmann test is. So uh, uh, just to recall, this is uh, the vertices and the edges of the graph. 
So before I describe the test, I need to uh, discuss the Grassman code. So uh, the Grassman code consists of a set of code words, uh, and for each linear function f from v to f2, we have a corresponding code word. And what is this code word? Uh, this is an assignment to the vertices of the Grassman graph of linear functions. Uh, namely, we assign the subspace L, the restriction of F, to it. Okay, so you take a linear function, you do restrictions to the subspaces, and you get a code word of the Grassman code. Okay, so this is uh, the code. And uh, what are the edges? Well, uh, the edges correspond to local consistent checks. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that the edge L, L prime, tests whether the assignment on L and the assignment on L prime agree on the intersection of the subfaces. So this is the picture. Okay, so let us make a few observations on this test. So first of all, if we have a legal code word of the Grassman code, then this test passes uh, with probability one, because uh, these are uh, restrictions of the same function. So of course they agree on the intersection. But uh, the interesting question is what happens if this test passes with high probability, which we next discuss. But before that, let us know that this is a two to two test. And uh, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that the assignments of L and L prime align in pairs according to the intersection on L intersection L prime. So uh, what do I mean by that? If you take any function on L intersection L prime, it has two extensions to L and two extensions to L prime that are linear because you have only one more dimension. So these are the agreements. So this is the two to two. And uh, what turns out is that the following is the interesting question about this test. So suppose we have some word, not necessarily a code word, that passes the test with probability epsilon. Epsilon is non negligible. Does this word have to be somewhat related to a code word of the Grassman code? Meaning to some global linear function f. Okay, so this question is uh, rather vague because uh, what does it mean to correspond to a global uh, world, to a global function? And in fact, you can consider this uh, many meanings of this question. And if you consider two simplistic meanings, then the answer is no, it, it, it is false. But nevertheless, you can consider more complicated versions, which turn out to be both useful for the two to two application and also uh, their tool, which is uh, very good. And yeah, so we'll discuss that. But before that, let me just tell you a little about what two to two implies. Okay. So, uh, uh, so in fact, two to two has uh, some applications, not as many as the unique conjecture. But still, uh, so what do we have? So, of course, uh, we have the two, two games between one minus epsilon and epsilon is hard. And if you think about it for a little bit, you immediately get hardest for unique games between half minus epsilon and epsilon. Okay. And uh, then you have hardest results for independent set, which was actually the thing that we studied uh, at the start of this uh, line, and also for coloring and for max cut gain. Uh, so I won't really read uh, all these things. Uh, you get some uh, others for independent set. Well, we think that the, the most interesting aspect of it is that the soundness is vanishing while the completeness is some constant. Uh, you guess improve the hardness for web discover uh, and uh, for coloring almost color for colorable graphs and for master game. And also there is this thing called the intermediate uh, CSP conjecture uh, by, by Boaz Barak. 
And uh, uh, yeah, so assuming ETH, we have, uh, we show that this uh, conjecture is also true, meaning uh, there are alpha smaller than beta, such that you have some uh, CSP, namely unique games between some uh, two constants, uh, 49, 0.49 and 0 0.01, such that this problem can be solved in two to the n to the beta time, uh, but not in time two to the n to the alpha. But this is again assuming uh, ETH. Okay. And uh, we didn't actually look for uh, too many implications because we think that the, the two to two thing is really the, the thing that is interesting. But as far as we know, there could be many more. Okay. So let me recap uh, the talk so far. Uh, we've seen, or uh, I, I, I told you that there is a reduction from thrill to thrilling to through two games. And we established that what we need to study is the Grassmann test. And uh, the question was, uh, suppose we have some word that passes the test with non-negligible probability. Uh, does this test, does this word correspond to some global function? And again, in some non-obvious manner. And up next, we'll uh, discuss how to study this test via expansion properties. So if there are any questions, this is a, a good time to ask because uh, we switch topic now. Okay. Um, so let's discuss uh, graph expansion. Uh, so let me remind you what expansion is. So let G be a D regular uh, undirected graph. So given a set of vertices, the expansion of the set is simply the number of edges that go between S and its complement divided by the total number of edges that touch S. Okay, so just to give you, just to remind you, a, a graph is usually called an expander if the expansion of any set containing at most half of the vertices is bounded away from zero, meaning it is at least some epsilon, which is constant. But for us, uh, we will call good expansion if the expansion is close to one. So we want expansion to be almost optimal. Okay. Okay, so uh, what can we say about the uh, expansion in the, the graphing graph? Uh, so here is a fact, which is uh, not too hard to prove. Suppose you have a set of vertices of size delta n. You know? Then the set of vertices contains at least delta squared fraction of the edges in the graph. Uh, yeah, this is unfortunate. But if you play around with uh, this fact, what you achieve is that the expansion of the set is at most one minus delta. So there is a limit to how close to one can we get. Uh, but Dor? Yeah. But if you wish, you can you can move uh, the window. Maybe you can try. But uh, that's that's true for any graph, right? Not just for the Grassmann graph, right? If you have a big set, um... it's not going to have expansion more than one minus delta. I mean, you can always. No, you can expect to see to get this if you take a random subset. You expect yeah, yeah. delta fraction of the edges to happen to land inside the set just because the set is size. Yeah, yeah, for a random set, but this is true for any set. Right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, the question is: uh, Are there any sets that uh, for which this is not tight? Meaning, are there any sets uh, for which the expansion is much smaller than one minus delta? And the answer is yes. There are such sets. And we are going to show two examples. Okay, so these are very important examples because they are very instructive to what you can expect from this graph. And the first example is uh, what we call a zoom-in example. So uh, let us fix x, some non-zero vector, and consider the set of subspaces that contain x. Then I claim that this set is expansion roughly half. So why is that? If we fix any uh, such uh, subspace that contains x, 
then a random neighbor of it has half of the, con the points in common. So the probability that one of them is X is roughly half. So uh, L prime is in SX with probability roughly half. This means that the expansion is half. So uh, are there any more examples? So uh, yes. Uh, here is a dual example, uh, which we call zoom out example. So now instead of taking a point, let us take a hyperplane. So W is a, a subspace of co-dimension one. And now we take the set of subspaces that are contained inside W. Then uh, by similar argument, argument that I'm not gonna say, this set also has expansion roughly half. This is because W contains half the, half the points. Uh, so now uh, the question is, are there any other sets of size half, right? We, we've seen two examples. And uh, yeah, of course they are, right? You can take one example and perturb it a little bit and you get a new example. But this is cheating. This is not really a different example. Um, so we, we wish to, to say if there are any inherently different examples, but we need to define what, what does it mean. Before we do that, uh, let us make uh, two observations. So these examples do not come out of nowhere. In fact, uh, they are both induced uh, subgraphs of this Grassmann graph, which are by themselves Grassmann graph of lower dimension, of lower order. And in fact, they are, uh, they are very uh, special because if you consider the, like it's trivial, if you focus on those induced subgraphs, then suddenly this set becomes all of the vertices. So they are very not random, these sets. So we are gonna to try to capture this notion of being close to these examples. No. Okay, so. so maybe you yes, want so to say that, that uh, say those two sets, especially the first one, they're actually tiny, tiny sets and they still don't expand. So that's the yes. worrisome thing, right? Yeah, that's important point. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, so so we need to capture what does it mean to be close to these examples. And uh, here is an important definition. So we say a set S is R epsilon pseudo random if any combination of zoom ins and zoom outs, meaning going into these subgraphs increases the density of the set by at most epsilon. Okay, so this example is a little technical, so let us consider two examples. So first of all, what happens if we just pick a vertex set at random? Uh, then uh, random vertex sets don't, don't care about uh, which uh, into subgraphs we look at. They look like, they look the same. So they don't increase the density by much, meaning they're highly uh, super random. But in sharp contrast, uh, the previous two examples we've seen are very not super random. They are not one, one minus little of one super random. Because as I already said, they have little of one density, but once you zoom in or zoom out once, they become everything. So they have density one. So a very large increase. And now the statement that we like to study is the following. Suppose S has low expansion, well, here low means bounded away from one, then the set must not be pseudo random. Meaning there is some combination of zoom ins and outs that increases the density significantly. Okay, so uh, uh, counter positively, the statement said that if we have a set which is pseudo random, then it must have near perfect expansion. And this is the way we are going to think about this data from, from now on. Okay. So, okay, uh, this is a statement about expansion, about pseudo randomness, but of a set. So, why should we care about this? statement, uh, why should we study it at all? 
So I, I didn't tell you what are the examples that show that uh, this uh, basic question in the Grassmann test uh, fails for the most natural uh, tries. Uh, but the, the quick component there is in fact sets that have small expansion. So we thought that, uh, okay, if you want to study the test, you must first study what are non-expanding sets. And hopefully this will lead, 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 shed light on the more general question of the test. And yeah, it turns out we were sort of right in the following sense. So here is a theorem by Barak, Farian, and Storer. Uh, the statement in above actually implies that the harassment te test works. So if you prove the statement, you immediately get for free that uh, this more complicated version of the local to global thing actually works. So if you wish to resolve the to conjecture, all you need to do is prove the statement. Maybe just organize the high level again. I mean, uh, be more specific. So there are lots of moving parts. And I think none of them is trivial. So maybe give us a picture again of what's actually going on here. Yeah, so we've seen uh, the Gartner test. We said that uh, if you want to analyze the PCP, the two to two construction, then you need to study this uh, local to global test. Okay. And then it turns out that to study this test, all you need to do is prove this statement. You need to study what sets have far from perfect expansion. Okay, and, and this reduction between the statement and this uh, uh, statement uh, was done by Barack Farah in store. Uh, does it clarify the high level? Yeah, so this gives you the linearity test, but then you still have to work and get it into this whole PCP. Yeah, you need, yeah, you still need to work on the outer PCP and so on, but I, I won't say anything about that. So the plan is to focus on the local to global test. Yeah. And it's not only on this statement because uh, we have this theorem now. Okay. Uh, so what we, do we know to say about do we know to say about this statement? Uh, before I tell you what, what we know, let's uh, recall the definition of pseudo randomness and uh, recall the statement. Uh, so here is the, the, the something that uh, you can prove. Uh, this was done with uh, Dino, Code, Kinder, and Safra. Uh, if we have a set of vertices that is one epsilon pseudo random, then each expansion must be much larger than half what we've seen before. And in fact, it must be even almost larger than three over four. Okay. Uh, again, uh, this uh, pseudo random means there are no zoom ins or outs that increase density by epsilon. But again, we want to study higher expansion. Right, we want uh, to get close to one. Uh, so uh, can we say anything more? Uh, so in the same paper, we also show that if the set is a uh, more pseudo-random, meaning it is two epsilon pseudo-random, then now the expansion must be at least seven over eight, minus a little bit. Question? Or keep interrupting you though, but this, those, those statements are tight, right? If uh, the number seven eight. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. It is tight. We'll see. I hope. I hope to see okay. why. And um, yeah, uh, and this is a uh, this. If you want to prove uh, partial results, this is already enough to get a new results for two, two games and unique games. But uh, yeah, to resolve the whole thing, you need to get all the way to one. And uh, this is what uh, we did recently. Uh, so together with uh, Cotton Safra, uh, we show the following. So for any eta uh, larger than zero, there exists R and Epsilon such that if S is sufficiently pseudo-random, meaning uh, R Epsilon pseudo-random, then the expansion is at least one minus eta. So this, is, this confirms the statement that we started with. Okay, and again, this uh, statement is only for small sets, really, but uh, let's forget about it for now. Okay, so let's recap again. 
Uh, we've seen a theorem uh, stating that uh, if you have a pseudo random set, then it has near perfect expansion. And we've seen that this theorem implies uh, NPRNS4 to the two games, and also NPRNS4 in the games between half minus epsilon and epsilon. And uh, now I'd like to tell you that this is actually, this puts some barriers on uh, algorithms. And uh, uh, what do I mean by that? Then I mean that if you now want to refute the Unigans conjecture, then you really must exploit the near perfect completeness of it. And uh, roughly speaking, this is because uh, uh, most, if not all, of the algorithm techniques that we know of perform equally well when you give them unique games with value half or unique games with value one minus epsilon. Uh, so, uh, unless you think that this is uh, wrong, then you really need to use the perfect complete, the near perfect completeness. Uh, so, uh, next, in the rest of the talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we prove these expansion results. But uh, before that, if there are any questions, uh, this is a good time. Okay. So, uh, so what goes into the proof uh, of these expansion results? Uh, uh, so, uh, full analysis and uh, lots of it. And it comes in the two, two forms, uh, for analysis on the Grassmann graph and for analysis on the Boolean alpha cube. Uh, so what is the for analysis on the Boolean alpha cube? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, quite simple. Uh, all it says is that if you have a real valued function on minus one, one to them, then you can express it as a linear combination of monomials. And uh, this decomposition has uh, many useful properties and was proved, it was uh, used in many, many applications. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, for the Grassmann graph, uh, we don't have anything uh, like that. And we need to use something uh, less explicit, which is a block decomposition. Uh, so, to discuss uh, what is a, the block decomposition, I need to define the notion of level functions. Uh, so, what is a level i function? Uh, so, let's go slowly. So, suppose we have some function, a real valued function on the vertices of the Grassmann graph. Uh, we say it is a level i function if there exists some function gi defined on i dimensional subspaces such that the value that f gives to L is the sum of values that gi gives to subspaces of dimension i of L. So this is a technical, so let's take a few examples. Uh, so what are level zero functions? Uh, well, we only have one zero dimensional subspace, uh, the zero space. So the function is only one value. So this is constant functions. Great. Uh, so let's do something a uh, little less trivial. So what are level one functions? So here we have two examples. So here's the first one. Let x be some non-zero vector and define the function fl to be one if and only if l contains x and zero otherwise. Then I claim that this is a level one function. So why is that? Let's take G1 of Y to be one if Y equals X and zero otherwise. So uh, what happens if L contains X? If L contains X, then one of the summons is one. So you get equality. And if L does not contain X, then all of the summons are zero. So you get zero. So we have equality again. Okay. Uh, so as it happens many times in these things, once you have one type of example, you also have a dual example. So now instead of taking a vector, we take a Hubble plane 
And now the function assigns the value one to L if and only if L is contained in the hyperplane W. Then I claim this is also a level one function. Uh, so why is that? Uh, now we define g1 of y to be 2 to the minus l if y is inside w and otherwise minus 2 to the minus l. So uh, let's check the equality. So if l is contained in w, then all the summons are 2 to the minus l. There are 2 to the l of them, so we get 1. But if L is not contained in W, then half of the vectors in it are in W and half are not. So we have equal number of pluses and minuses and we get zero. So again, we have equality. Question? Yeah. Uh, is there some explanation of these levels in terms of like the, I don't know, something like the representation theory of GLN? Um, yeah. But uh, somehow it's uh, for me at least it's difficult to think in these terms. So yeah, I prefer this view. But there would probably uh, be eigenspaces of that Laplacian, the thing that the yeah, yeah. graph basically, right? We will we'll say that in a moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So now that we have this notion, let us uh, return to the block position. Say what it is. Uh, so the block position is the following. Uh, uh, so it's a fact which is not too hard to prove. Any real valued function on the graph can be written as a sum of f0 plus f1 plus the data plus fl. Well, fi is a level i function, which is in addition orthogonal to all the previous levels. Okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, quite easy to prove, but it, it doesn't give us much information about this decomposition. But uh, you can prove it's not too hard that this function actually have more uh, properties. So here is uh, what we discussed uh, a moment ago. These functions are in fact eigenvectors uh, of the Grassmann graph with eigenvalue two to the minus i. Okay. Uh, so, so now that we know that, we can give an overview of the proof. Okay. Uh, so suppose we have set S whose expansion is bounded away from three over four, so at most three over four minus eta. So we want to apply our machinery. So let's define uh, FL to be the indicator of S, meaning it is one if L is inside S and zero otherwise. And let's say, so if you work with expansion a little bit, you do some inner products and things like that, you get that the expansion is one minus half times the mass on level one minus quarter of the mass on level two minus one over eight mass on level three and so on. This half quarter and so on are simply the eigenvalues of the eigenvectors. Okay. So now you look at it and you say, okay, what happens if the weight on level one is zero? Then we get one minus quarter minus one or eight and so on. So you get one minus a quarter uh, at most. So uh, you, you can, you have more than three over four expansion. So what it means is that the, the weight on level one cannot be zero. And in fact, it has to be non-negligible. Uh, so now the question becomes, what can you say about functions that have non-negligible weight on the first level? Can you say that again, Dor? I missed something. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we have a set S whose expansion is at most three over four minus eta. And then we write the expansion of S uh, using this, uh, the block decomposition. So it is one minus half times the mass on level one minus quarter uh, mass on level two and so on. And we think about the first level, we say, okay, uh, can it be zero? Then the observation here is that no, it cannot be zero because then you get at least 
1 minus a quarter, which is more than 3 over 4. Okay, so it means that, the other terms, but the, the w is sum to 1, so that doesn't Yeah, okay. precisely. Uh, so what it means is that the weight on level 1 cannot be 0, and in fact it tends to be non-negligible. Uh, so now the question becomes, what can you say about functions that have non-negligible weight on the first level? Okay, so uh, let us consider a simpler case, a toy case, where instead of having non-negligible weight, we have all of the weight on level 1. Uh, so here is the question. Suppose we have some uh, Boolean function on a Westman graph, which is purely level 1, meaning it is a sum of some constant function, delta, which is the density of S, plus a level 1 function, which is also orthogonal to the zero level. Okay, so what can you say about something like that? So let us think for a moment and see that something strange is going on here. Right. So f is Boolean valued. It gets only the value 0 and 1. And delta is constant. So this means that this large sum can only get two values, minus delta and 1 minus delta. On the other hand, its expectation is 0, because it is orthogonal to constant functions. So we get it deviates from its expectation with very high probability. Right, it, it, it's ne never around its uh, expectation. So something happens here, something happens that we should explain. And uh, to see that, let us make some abstraction. Uh, so instead of looking at this function g, let us look at random variables, z1 to z2 to the l, where z1, z2, and, and so on are the values of g on the first point of l, the second point of l, and so on. So what we know is that this sum also always deviates from its mean, and we ask ourselves, how can it happen? Okay, so, so here's the same question. This is sort of an anti-concentration of measure question. So we have a bunch of uh, random variables that have zero mean, and uh, we know that the sum deviates from its mean, and we ask ourselves, how can it happen? Uh, so we have a lot of theorem that say when the sum uh, is close to its uh, average. So if you have enough independence and boundedness, then the sum is close to its mean. So if it doesn't happen, then it means that either there is dependency or something is really unbounded. So this means that either there is a variable that has some large moment, so a large fourth moment, Otherwise, there must be strong correlations between the random variables z1 to zl. And formally, this is done by considering high moments of the sum. And what you conclude then, that in the first case, there is some zoom in that increases the density by a lot. And in the second case, you conclude that there exists some zoom out that increases the density by a lot. And uh, this is really where the, most of the work goes into, when in fact, you need a stronger structure from the decomposition that I've stated, but still you can get it. Okay. Uh, so, okay, this was for the first level, for a toy case, what about high levels? So the case of the second level is already more challenging. And the reason is that there are many more correlations now. There are many different kinds of correlation, and you need to control them all. You need to know what to do when they are large. And uh, it, it is possible, we did that. But then you have a lot of cases. And uh, then you try to extend it to higher levels, and you already have too many cases to handle. So you must do something more systematic. But uh, the question is how. And uh, this is precisely what it, we did in the last paper. We developed a more systematic way to analyze these correlations, which are four-wise correlations. 
And also, we actually work with a, a closely related graph, a Cayley graph, which is not a graph on graph, but it is a closely related to it. And I want also to mention that uh, we have uh, some joint work with uh, Dana Moscovich also on the Johnson graph. And this is somewhat related, but it is also simpler than Grassman graph. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is all I really wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? We have, we have plenty of time, so. Um, I, I was wondering if you could say something, hello? Yeah. Um, if you could say something more about the, um, the local to global condition. Uh, let me go back. Uh, so, 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 what do you, what, what is this question? I mean, I guess the question is, so, uh, what can you, like, for this local to global thing? Oh, what is the statement? Yeah, what, what is the statement, or can you give some intuition for yeah. what's happening? Yeah. So, so the first uh, hypothesis is, the, suppose you have uh, some, uh, word that passes the test with non negative probability, then you say, okay, maybe it is close to some code word uh, in the Grassman code itself. And uh, this is false. You, you, you can sort of take a bunch of these non-expanding examples, put some global function on each one of them, and then put them together. So they are consistent within the selves and major edges stay inside. So you don't have any global structure, but still you have consistency. So this is uh, why the most obvious uh, candidate fails. So what does the statement really says? It says the following. If you have some word that passes the test with non negative probability, then you can take some small set of vectors, Q, and a small co-dimension hyperplane, W, so that if you now restrict yourself to subspaces that contain Q and contain a W, then now you do have a global structure. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and this, this sounds uh, a little uh, complicated, but this actually turns out to be true. Yeah. Maybe you should say this is it's not obvious why this would be enough as an inner, inner PCP. Usually you, yeah. in inner PCPs, you expect a global structure, but somehow this was enough for you, even though it's there's really no global structure, there are potentially many linear functionals all mixed together, but the fact that you can isolate one somehow is enough. Yeah. Yeah, in the auto PCP, or I, I don't really want to discuss auto PC, but but if you have this sort of uh, structural result, then you need like be, between two auto PCPs, you need uh, to somehow correlate this Q and Ws, and yeah, yeah this is not not obvious, but uh, nevertheless, it can be done. Are there any conjectures as, uh, as how to uh, take this to the next level, namely to unique games? Uh, yeah, so this is a good question. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know any concrete path, but it's possible. And the issue of uh, perfect completeness is something you think can be doable? So the issue with perfect completeness is uh, we don't lose the, the completeness at any point in the reduction. It is simply that the starting point is a linear problem. So you cannot uh, hope to have the... So we, should call, uh, we should call Johan Hastad and complain, right? It's yeah, his yeah. fault. It's his fault, no, not ours. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> sorry? But you could imagine starting from another problem, except it breaks all your linear structure. Yeah, yeah. So it would certainly be nice to have a perfect completeness, uh, but we don't know how to achieve it. What's your question? 
Oh, dead? Yeah, the question to me, right? Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, no, 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 I don't know if you have to like put me up. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, my question is, um, I guess like this cross one graph has a natural two to two structure. Like you take an L dimensional subspace and you change one vector and get another one. Yeah. I guess you have like a natural two to one structure if you just like have L and L minus one dimensional subspaces together and you just have restrictions. Yeah, yeah. I should have said that. Uh, actually, I said the only results for two to two, but they actually hold for two to one with uh, the precise thing that you stated. Oh, really? So you have uh, yeah. So instead of adding uh, uh, L and L, you have L and L minus one, and the edges if one is containing the other. So you get the two to one conjecture with imperfect completeness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Question: You have to unmute yourself. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We hear you. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, thanks for the talk. This is very interesting. So, I'm just drawing analogs to um, to the vertex cover result uh, by the and Safra, right? So, it's yeah. you. They they were also picking subsets of size s, but they were just picking subsets of CSPs in some sense, right? And here yeah. you're you're very specific in picking. Uh, subsets of uh, like a three lin, and in fact, not just subsets. Yeah. It's a subspace structure that's crucial to your analysis. Am I getting that right? So we take a bunch of equations. We look at all, all, all the variables that are in these equations, and this forms this is a, a large space. And then we take this space and do the graph and graph there. So this is sort of the reduction. So okay. it has some similarity to, to the new software thing, but uh, the reduction has some limits, like the sum is can, they cannot be close to zero. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That, we can hear you. Oh, actually, we cannot hear you, even though you unmuted, that's strange. Is there time for... A few more comments or questions? Yes, you can, you can go ahead. OK. Um, yeah, so there's a question that was asked earlier about uh, understanding uh, the Fourier analysis of the Grassman graph in terms of uh, representations of GL uh, in Q. And uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, in fact, there is. And, uh, and the, we might be getting into uh, too much algebra here, but um, I'll just suffice it to say you can identify subspaces of um, of a vector sp of the vector space uh, over the field of VQ by taking um, cosets that correspond to the parabolic subgroup GLN minus K comma Q and GL uh, K comma Q. And so once you make that identification, then the representations are, uh, they're actually quite a, a quite beautiful object. And they're parameterized by the number, if you, so if you know a thing about Young Tableau, the, these, uh, these, we can call them eigenspaces of the Grassman graph, and they are parameterized by the number, uh, they have two rows, and each row, so uh, this, the second row has, uh, Either one cell, two cells, three cells, or k cells. So, so I, I wanted to say that uh, the eigenspaces of this Grassman graph is something that's that's uh, they're studied a lot in uh, finite geometry and even this area of extremal combinatorics called erdos quadratic combinatorics. So you you, you might uh, consider both of those areas as good resources for studying the uh, the nature of uh, the, the algebraic nature of the, of the Grassman graph. And I wanted to say, I wanted that, so now I have a, a question, and that is, have you looked at the isoparametric properties of uh, the Grassman graph to say things about expanding sets? Because there are things that are known, it, it just could be that uh, what you need, you need something stronger than what's already known. That's what I was curious about. Sorry if that went too fast. Uh, so, so my question is, uh, uh, are you aware of any isoparametric results for the uh, for the Grassman graph, that that you could use to say something about expansion. For uh, uh, so, 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 so,
Uh, yeah, so uh, the simple answer is that uh, I, I don't know about any easy primitive results about the expansion. Uh, otherwise, I, I'd probably stay them. Uh, yeah, and yeah, but part of the 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 difficulty is that uh, we we don't re we didn't really understand the the structure of the decomposition there. So we did what we could, but at the end of the day, we had to, to switch to this uh, Kaley graph, which also makes life easier. But uh, yeah, this is a, I hope this is a satisfactory answer. So I guess so it's possible that one can find a more elegant uh, approach directly using Grassman graphs. Yeah. It easily, those things easily get very messy. Uh, maybe one more answer here would be that, Dora, I think you need more than maybe just isoperimetry, you really have to characterize those uh, uh, you know, those, those uh, non-expanding sets. So then maybe this is another property. Um, yeah, you have a nice combinatorial characterization of those sets. It's not so much a functional thing, more combinatorial thing, but yeah. perhaps we could look at that too, yeah. Thank you. And any more questions? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, you get like an imperfect completeness for the uh, two to two thing, but do you get something about like how well Lasserre does? Like, can it not distinguish between one and epsilon? So, so yeah, so for Lasserre, you get perfect. Yeah, because yeah, you have perfect for a trillion, so it transfers. And that's for many levels of Lasserre, right? Okay. Great. Any more questions, Ryan? Well, maybe this is a little bit boring and premature, but did you like work out the, the dependence of like epsilon on uh, the alphabet size? Um, uh, yes, but I don't remember it now. It's okay. not too terrible. Yeah, the, the soundness is a. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say off the top of my head. Okay, just curious. So if there are no more questions, so uh, you're welcome to stay here, chat offline. We'll um, we'll take us offline. I may just remind you that in two weeks uh, we have Michael Kearns. Okay, so hope to see you then. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.